Uh, I am Professor Mohammed Hamdan, uh, uh, Professor of uh, Anglo-American Literary Studies at Anajah National University. And today, uh, please, I'm really pleased actually to welcome very special guests from, from uh, the US and our university as well. Uh, uh, the, the, this panel actually is entitled Censoring Palestine, the Political Economy of Zionism and uh, Neoliberalism. And uh, where the, the, the session uh, will open actually start with uh, uh, Mimura Prosta, who is a postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Institute of Research on the African Diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean. Uh, today, she's actually going to speak to us about the neoliberal turn and empire making occupations in Haiti and Palestine. Uh, uh, please. Uh, are you ready? Yes, yes, stay in there or do I can stay here. Okay, I can use this. I may just stand up just to. Oh, yeah, just. Um, sure. Are you interested? Do you want to use the other uh, laptop? Yes, I do. I just stand. Yeah. So, how many people know where Haiti is? Okay. So, I just want to show on the map really quickly so we get a sense of where it is. Um, so, it shares an island with the Dominican Republic. And it's in the Caribbean Sea. Um, and it's very close to Miami, right? So you can see where it is in relation to the United States. And that's the only part that's going to be visual. So I invite you to listen. So I'm going to be talking about occupation in Haiti. But I think that there are a lot of parallels to draw with what's happening in Palestine. And a lot that I have to learn about Palestine to understand Haiti. Um, so just a little brief history lesson to contextualize. Um, the conversation. Haiti is the first and only um, revolt of enslaved people that led to what we call proudly the first black republic um, in 1804. And Haiti is what the indigenous people who were completely decimated um, called the land before colonization, or before Christopher Columbus. So it was very important for the, the revolutionaries to go back to that indigenous term to refer to this new um, country. And um, the revolutionary leaders, however, unfortunately, um, did not complete the promises of revolution, and they embraced a European model of nation building, nation state building, subject formation and development, and continued the extractivist plantation model. So Haiti, before um, the revolution in the 18, at the end of the 18th century, was the number one producer of sugar in the world. So the leaders just continued that same type of um, development model, and they were concerned with being properly modern. So they rejected the cultural practices of previously enslaved people, including their Creole language and their Vodou beliefs. And they also erased, not surprisingly, the contribution of revolutionary women from the national imaginary and discourse. Land was not redistributed, so previously enslaved people were coerced into laboring on their own land, often for free and exchanging for living on this land. And this is a practice that continued um, throughout the Caribbean after emancipation as well. And, uh, American, U.S. American South, and education remained a privilege for the quote-unquote post-colonial elites. And colorism was very much entrenched, so the, the same types of racist practices that had been under colonialism continued in the post-colonial era, and the sons of the colonialists um, continued to retain political and economic power. Um, so I say all of this because it's sort of the same story, right, in the 21st century that's being repeated. Um, and I, I want us to, to keep in mind the colonial legacy that, that continues to mark Haiti today and much of the world. So the century following the revolution was marked by militaristic regimes, right? So folks were very concerned about new invasions. So we continue to keep these very militaristic approaches to governance. Um, and, and much of the country is marked by regionalism. So it's not until the beginning of the 20th century in 19... 14, 1915, um, sorry, which if we think about the links with um, Palestine, right, the, the beginning of the 20th century, another wave of colonialism, um, that power is centralized in the capital of Haiti, which is now Port-au-Prince, under U.S. occupation. So we moved from the French occupation to the U.S. occupation, and the U.S. occupied much of the Caribbean at that time, dollarizing those economies and leading to U.S. hegemony in the Americas that then right, tells us a story about U.S. becoming a world power. And the U.S. occupation, just really quickly, because 
much of what Haiti is experiencing today and today's occupation is directly the result of this occupation in the early 20th century. They imposed um, apartheid laws and Jim Crow laws that exacerbated the racial tensions between Haitians, so essentially separating the U.S. troops that were predominantly white men from the U.S. South um, from Haitians. And it allowed for foreign ownership of land. It trained a new Haitian army to help, them build and to help build and secure the roads that would lead to the plantations of rubber, for example, that supplied tires for warring Europe. So we can see some of the connections here. And obviously, to control insurrection. But most importantly, the occupation established a development through indebtedness model that shapes Haiti and much of the post-colonial world, foreshadowing the practices of the World Bank and the IMF today. So essentially, the US loans us the money to purchase their US manufactured goods, right? And then we have to repay them interest and we're, we're consuming their goods, right? So just think about that. Um, and so I want to note that the US presence in Haiti was encouraged by some factions of the Haitian elite who sought to consolidate their own power and to enjoy cosmopolitan lives, right? The good life in Haiti. So I, I want us to remain critical of our so-called leaders who often collude with the colonizers. So 100 years later, Haiti is still under US domination and I will say US colonialism. But most importantly, since 1994, has been under what I'm, I'm playing around with to call it a non-governmental occupation. I'm trying to propose us to think about the different modes of domination of empire that are deployed in that obscure white supremacy, US hegemony and capitalist exportation to a deterritorialization of power. So the occupation Neo-colonialism in Haiti, um, even though the U.S. is behind it, right? It, it's sort of very difficult to to um, identify the U.S. right directly, particularly because it's being um, basically on the ground. You see the U.N. right, um, and so I'm going to sort of break down what this occupation looks like and what is most obvious, and I think also in the case of Palestine, right, is the presence of of um, military violence, right. And in the case of Haiti, you have the United Nations peacekeeping troops. And since 1994, for example, um, 20,000 of them came to occupy Haiti. And what they did was disband the Haitian army and begin to train a new police. And they did not, as opposed to how people often think that they were, they, they left, many troops stayed and continued to train new generations of police officers. And by 2004, and I won't go into the historical details, right? More troops were sent in, um, 5,000 more, headed by Brazil. And what they do essentially is train the Haitian police, but they also surveil the Haitian ghettos, and they kill so-called gangsters, which are mostly unemployed working-class young men who are supporters of the democratically elected president who was deposed for a second time. And there's a current case against the 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 UN mission for the massacre of 150 people in this particular um, um, neighborhood in Haiti, in addition to a million other massacres, but this is a particular ongoing one right now. And they occupy as well the National Public University, where many rebels right, were politicized and mobilized, right? So this is, the public university is very central to an anti-occupation response, and the UN has been instrumental in policing that space and killing students who are, who are resisting. And today, there's a current physical occupation of the UN troops in the university. Um, and also professors, right, who, who speak against the occupation are targeted. And of course, with that comes, right, corporeal violence, including rape, rape of children, and the transmission of disease like cholera. So by 2010, 5,000 people had died of cholera already, right? Um, and, by 2000, and, and by 2010, the United Nations had already spent $5 billion to support the occupation. And that money goes basically in supporting the staff that has come to develop Haiti, right? And we can talk about the money. So the second and most sort of acceptable evidence of this occupation is the omnipotence of the international non-governmental organizations, right? so the NGOs and the various UN agencies in managing social services. And so I just want to quickly give some examples of how that works. So today, the largest recipient of USAID contracts in Haiti and in the world, including Afghanistan for the reconstruction of Afghanistan, is Keymonix, which is a publicly traded company that builds soccer stadiums that no one uses, 
and provides school supplies to rural children. The Catholic NGO World Vision raises awareness and lobbies the government to enact policies to protect children against violence. Doctors Without Borders provides free health care, and the French Embassy promotes la francophonie through its cultural centers. So you essentially have all of the social aspects of Haiti being managed by an international um, non-governmental um, coordination. And so you have the 1994, um, one of the features of the neoliberal turn is this internationalization of civil society. To the point where Haiti has come to be known as a republic of NGOs because we have the most number of NGOs per capita in the world. Um, and has led also to a growing, what my colleague Mark Schuller calls an NGO class. Right, so a series of folks who basically depend on the occupation for their livelihood and therefore are less likely to speak against occupation. Um, and another feature of what's happened is that social movement organizations have become NGOized, right? using this model to get international funds to do supposedly radical work that in fact has turned them um, less radical in, in, in their work. And the narrative of nonviolence has been conflated with armed resistance, right, that's very different than the kinds of violence that white supremacist patriarchal capitalist occupation um, enacts on people. And this is in fact a global trend and something we need to further um, impact. So the third part um, of this occupation is again not particular to Haiti, and that is the control of the economy by the U.S. via the Haitian state. So in fact, neoliberalism depends on a strong state in order to implement itself. So the Haitian state is not a failed state, as we might as people call it, but in fact is accomplishing its mandate, which is to promote the local and particularly the U U.S. capitalist interests. So international financial institutions like the IMF are key to the continuation of the logic of development through indebtedness that in turn fosters dependency. <coughs> so Haiti, for example, 51% um, of the goods that we consume, including our food, are imported. 80% of the rice that we consume is imported, particularly from the United States. So Haiti's main trade partner <coughs> is the United States. Right? If we think about what colonialism means, is right, is um, limiting your your trade partnership to right your 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 um, the metropole, if you will, um, and also the establishment of free trade zones. Um, so essentially, there are foreign-owned industrial and agricultural zones that function as sovereign territories that are not subject to regulations by the state and are usually tax exempt, and there's a million examples of that, and sort of driving down the minimum wage to less than five US dollars a day. And um, some of the other features are the, the, the involvement of the US Embassy, for example, in declaring the results of the election even before the local electoral council has announced um, the results that's happened in the last two um, uh, elections that we've had. And, and in the interest of time, I'll just say that this non-governmental configuration of power is not unique to Haiti. It is a continuation of colonial practices that have marked our histories for the last six centuries and requires us to think critically about what we mean when we say development in our attempt to imagine a decolonized world. So we, those of us supposedly invested in the pursuit of social justice, need to think and organize beyond our borders and regions. And linking Haiti to Palestine does that work. So from the people of Haiti to Palestine, I say, yukawem, yukawem, yukawem. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emma, for this interesting, generous, and insightful conversation. And uh, I would like to summarize some of what she said in Arabic. Uh, for those who. تحدثت في الواقع عن مجموعة من القضايا وتطرقت إلى مجموعة من الأساليب الاحتلال والاضطهاد في جزيرة هايتي التي كانت محتلة في عام 1804 من الاحتلال اللي الاحتلال الفرنسي من الفرنسيين وهتحدث كذلك عن حملات من الاستعمار استمرت بعد عام 1915 بعد احتلال الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وظهور نوع من السيطرة غير مباشرة التي لا تتدخل فيها الحكومة في عام 1994 عندما بدأت الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية بتدريب البوليس 
الهايتي وكمان وكمان استحضار بوليس من من البرازيل للسيطرة على الشعوب وكمعهم وتحدث كذلك عن الـ عن الـ عن الـ الطلاب والمدرسين في الجامعات الذين يعانون بسبب الكبت يعانون الكبت بسبب بسبب الكلام سو so, كلامهم حديثهم عن الحرية مكبوت بسبب بسبب تسلط الحكومة الأمريكية وتحدث كذلك عن موضوع مهم جدا وهو ظهور ثقافة الـ NGOs في في جزيرة هايتي التي جلبت معها نوع من الوعي تجاه مشكلة الجزيرة وسكانها والتوقف الحرية كذا منها مثلا ظهور كلاس طبقة طبقة الانجيوز وتحدث كذلك النهاية عن 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 موضوع الدول الفاشلة وهو وهو مفهوم مفهوم ظهر في أول وقت الأمم المتحدة بعد عام 1990 في 1990 وتحكي بنا إنه هايتي هي ليست دولة فاشلة بالمقاييس وإنما هي دولة ناجحة وإنما المشكلة هي هي الطريقة التي أو الأسلوب الاستعماري والما بعد الاستعماري الذي تمارسه الولايات المتحدة في هذه الدولة والتي جعلتها إلى تحولتها إلى دولة مستوردة للموارد التي تنتجها في نفس الوقت. Uh, okay, now actually we will move to uh, the uh, second presenter, Salim Shihada, who is going to speak to us today about anti-colonial knowledge, general union of Palestinian students and Palestinian diasporic uh, practice. So please help me in welcoming Salim Shihada on the stage. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to thank everybody who made this conference and this panel happen. I want to thank Dr. Abdul Hadi, uh, Dr. Said, Dr. Saida, Dr. Khalid, Noor, um, uh, Dr. Mahid, um, as well as our moderator, Dr. Muhammad. Um, as part of anti-colonial frameworks and scholarship and activism, my presentation will discuss the campus control policies at San Francisco State University and its redefinition and deployment uh, against student and faculty organizers. My, pre uh, my presentation focus on, focuses on the latest episode of the overt and institutional collusion between the Office of the Dean of Students and the SFSU Police Department. On invitation from, San Francis from the San Francisco chapter of the main multinational student organization, Hillel, near Barakat, the mayor of Occupy Jerusalem was scheduled to visit and speak at San Francisco State in April of 2016. In response, the students of the General Union of Palestine Students led a demonstration countering his visit. In, in his role as mayor of Occupy Jerusalem, Barakat is an architect of apartheid, colonialism, and the violence against Palestinians. Those who demonstrated against Barakat did so with the fundamental understanding that anti-Zionist and anti-colonial struggles for justice and liberation engaged the question of discourse, space, and power on our, on our college campuses. The students chanted with the aid of mobile microphone uh, systems for nearly 45 minutes during Barakat's speech. Ultimately, two of Gup's students, demonstrators, who led the chants were subjected to student conduct hearings. Uh, where they were found guilty of breaking university regulations on amplified sound codes and were put on probation, um, as was the GUPS organization. In the media, these two women, as well as five other student demonstrators, were, uh, were placed on Zionist blacklist website, Canary Mission. They became the subject of online harassment, threats of rape and death, and had their employers called demanding they be fired and were stalked on campus, surveyed while, it, while, surveyed while in the organization's office, and were followed to their cars in the parking lots after class. This was done with complete impunity as university officials, fully aware of this harassment, took no action beyond suggesting they, suggest, uh, they request police escort. This brings us to the question of police on college campuses and their role in protecting the interests of neoliberal and the colonial university. What is most important from the Barakat protest are the university administrators' discussions both before and after the demonstration. The police chief uh, communicated with university administrators that his plan, uh, this contingency plan of the protest is twofold. First, is to erect a designated protest area outside of the room of speech. Second is to issue citizens' arrest forms uh, 
two Halal members to use against the Palestinian demonstrators. It is police chief's second suggestion to issue citizens' arrest forms that lays the foundation of ex uh, ex <laughs> escalated and institutionalized police collusion within the operations of the Dean of Students. Prior to the Barakat protest, the police were seen as an auxiliary force that was called in by the university administration at their discretion. Yet the newly implemented campus control policy put in place because of the Barakat protest included a five-step intervention guideline that requires the police to be present at every demonstration. And it has codified into official policy the arrest of students uh, and, that, and that demands that, that the police coordinate with the Dean of Students and their, de and their designees. Uh, that summer, the Office of the Dean of Students and the University Police Department held department-wide tra joint training sessions of the new regulations where they used the example of the Barakat protest. This raises the issue, the question, um, so, again, this raises the question of who will conduct these arrests. As a, uh, so the Dean of Students has already noted in a uh, public forum, a uh, campus-wide public forum, that if the police find no legal reason to arrest demonstrating students, the Dean will send a designee to conduct the citizen's arrest. Those who will be tasked with the charge are mid-level staff, those whose, those whose contracted jobs are to help students navigate the resources of the university, but whose employment has been co-opted for the use of student surveillance and policing. And so this raises the issue that if ordered to arrest students, will these, individu will these individuals comply? Will they resign in protest or not comply and be fired for insubordination? Such questions are intrinsically rooted in the neoliberalism of the university. For example, what we know from Freedom of Information Act requests that are linked to the lawsuit that is attacking Dr. Abdul Hadi, uh, the San Francisco University Police, uh, sorry, the San Francisco State University's president's emails regarding the protest note uh, a conversation that happens between the Koch brothers and university administrators. And now the, the, the Koch brothers are a multi-billion dollar, they're multi-billion dollar developers and Zionists. And they attempted in, the, in these negotiations to strong arm the university into expelling the Palestinian students during their, their contract negotiations um, and over a $1 million grant. Let me, let me repeat this. Um, I'm so sorry. I had it written, but I, I paraphrased. <laughs> uh, so we found that the Koch brothers, who are multi-billion dollar developers and Zionists, had attempted to strong arm the university into expelling the Palestinian student demonstrators during the Koch brothers and SFSU's negotiations over a $1 million grant to the university. The Koch brothers pulled out of their grant offer after Gups was put on probation and not expelled by the director of student services who conducted the student hearings. Soon after, that director was fired from the university in what, was clear, in what clearly made him a scapegoat for the university from Zionist pressures. How this is made possible is that the employees of the office of the, uh, of the administrators are contract, uh, are, are uh, at will employees that are not contracted or protected by uh, unions. And so, in, so those who do not follow the line of the that the university sets uh, face repercussions, which include retaliation, firing, and uh, placing them on uh, blacklists from future employment at other respective universities. What this does then it ra is raise the issue of labor and student rights, as the neoliberalism of universities have gutted hard fought for labor protections and has laid serious doubt that any member of the administration can fairly oversee any issue concerning Palestine and anti-colonial organizing and scholarship. Now, one thing that Dr. Abdul Hadi mentioned in her speech was a Know Your Rights Fair. I know that we're strapped for time, but so what I'm going to do is, if those who are interested, we are leading a workshop uh, at 1 to 2. And so if those who are interested, I can definitely talk about the, new, the, the oper, operalization of uh, Zionism and neoliberalism during that workshop as it, op, as it operated through the Know Your Rights Fair. Thank you. Thank you, Salim, for this engaging 
conversation in, in cycle, actually, enlightening about the uh, the. Uh, uh, I'm going to shift to Arabic now again. تحدث سليم شهادة عن موضوع مهم جدا وهو الطلاب والبوليس في المؤسسات الأكاديمية. بدي ألخص الحكاية بسرعة. هو بتعرض لموضوع كبت الطلاب في المؤسسات في داخل الحرم الجامع في المؤسسات الأكاديمية من قبل البوليس وهو ما يجعل الجامعات تتحول إلى بالنهاية إلى أماكن استعمارية التعليم يصبح نوع من أنواع الاستعمار بسبب بسبب كبت أصوات الحرية كبت أصوات الطلاب في في المؤسسات الأكاديمية وأذكر مثال مهم جدا في نهاية المطاف في نهاية الورقة تحدث عن الطلاب الفلسطينيين بعض الطلاب الفلسطينيين الذين تم طردهم من جامعة سان فرانسيسكو مقابل منحة بقيمة مليون دولار مليون ونص مليون ونص وهو نوع من الضغط الصهيوني خلينا نسميه صح بس هو اللي اندفع مليون ونص بس هو نتيجة أو الضغط اللوبي صحيح ل ل لإسكات صوت المعارضين طلاب الفلسطين خصوصا طلاب الفلسطينيين الذين يفتكروا إلى اتحاد يونيون اتحاد لدفاع عن مصالحهم وهم أجهرهم في النهاية عرضة ل لمشاكل في المستقبل تتعرض بوضع تتعلق بوظائفهم المستقبلية Okay, thank you. That was really interesting, uh, Salim. Now uh, we will actually move to the third presenter, uh, Hayimi Bevi. Thank you, actually, for teaching me the Spanish. Uh, I didn't actually know that J is pronounced as Han in Spanish. Uh, uh, actually, Jamie uh, Vivi has been uh, working for 40 years, actually, uh, or, uh, as a, a labor organizing. Organizer, and he uh, at the Transit Workers United, and he is now teaching at the University of San Francisco. Uh, today, he is going to speak to us about U.S. labor, Zionism, neoliberalism, and Palestine. So, please help me in welcoming. <laughs> Good morning, Sabal here. <laughs> I always mispronounce it. Uh, thank you for coming, all of you, especially the students. What we are trying today is to have a discussion. Many things that we are presenting you may find difficult to comprehend, or it seems that it may not necessarily directly link to the immediate issues that you face as students, as people living under occupation, with all the multitude of problems and struggles of survival that you have. But this is where it, it becomes very important, the exchange of ideas and experiences. And for us, as academics, as organizers, I am and have been not an academic, a professional, full-time political activist, union organizer, and also in that context, a union organizer and educator. When we were young, your age, when I was your age, we had a very critical crisis in world politics, and that was the Vietnam War. Most people in the U.S. had no idea what Vietnam was. People were being sent to Vietnam not having left their neighborhoods. <coughs> and it became very important to educate, to enlighten an understanding of what Vietnam was, who Vietnamese were, what was their struggle and why we needed to stop the war. And where we did it was at the universities and at the communities. We had teachings as this is a teaching. And through that process, we began to understand the dynamics and realities of Vietnam, the realities as 
explained by Martin Luther King, who spoke out against the war in Vietnam, connected the war in Vietnam with the social political reality in the U.S., and especially in the context of the struggle that he was leading, the black civil rights power struggle. So that we had to do this in order to begin to open up the political struggle that eventually became millions of people against the war. And today, we face the critical question of Palestine. And as you know, the US is the principal basis for the power of the Israeli state. It's our money. <coughs> the billions that finance the state of Israel and makes possible the occupation, the material, political, military occupation. So for us as U.S. political activists, and many of us do not recognize the citizenship question, we are U.S. political activists. We have had to struggle how to overcome the difficulty of raising what is said to be the complex question of Palestine. It is so difficult to discuss Palestine. And I remember when I first started as a union activist, and I came from the Vietnam struggle, from the Puerto Rican struggle for independence, and also I was educated by the Palestinian struggle back in the early 60s. And when I tried to introduce the question of Palestine at our national gathering of our unions, the various unions I worked with, I was always confronted with the issue, no, you shouldn't be raising this issue. This is too difficult. This is too complex. This is not what the workers, our workers, want to know about. And how do you explain it? And you're going to be charged with being anti-Semitic. And what about Israel? I was always confronted, not only myself, but other political activists throughout various unions across the country. And the reason we raise this is because this becomes critical and why we're having this discussion. How to break down and educate the mass of people in the U.S. who only get a very distorted conception of the struggle. We are trying to challenge the attempt to legitimate the colonial narrative, to undermine that idea that somehow what exists here is justified by the fact that Israel is perceived to be the democratic state and the Palestinians are perceived to be guided by undemocratic, social, political, and religious realities. 